Hi, in this video, we will overview the content in chapter nine of your Pearson textbook, which talks about or refers to how to gather data for experimental designs. So in principle, you still want to have data that is that contains randomization factors that allow you to use small subsets of data and generalize them to a population of data. What you're doing in an experiment that's different than in a survey is you're trying to control certain variables that measure the impact that certain stimuli have on experimental subjects in order to then measure these effects and have a cause and effect relationship uh, estab be established by the factor control variation that occurs as part of the experiment. So unlike in a survey where the researcher asks a question to elicit information from the subjects and simply records the subject's opinions or reactions to the questions. In an experiment, the researcher actually controls who is exposed to what in the experiment. And by having such control is then able to measure cause and effect with regards to uh, the experimental design. So this, as this slide shows, in an experiment, the researcher actively and deliberately manipulates the factors or the variables uh, that apply to the experimental subjects. And critical to the issue of representative data, the experimenter or the researcher is able to assign experimental subjects in a random fashion. And this is how we're able to then have reasonable confidence that we can establish cause and effect through experimentation. What are the basic principles of an experimental design data? First is control. What you uh, do in an experimental design is create the conditions around the experiment that control variations in factors other than the ones that are being used in being measured by the experiment. In this case, that's what enables us to then build an argument for cause and effect because other factors are probably not responsible for the measured realizations in the experiment. Second aspect of design is the experimental subjects have to be assigned to different sources of treatments, what we call different uh, exposures to different variable values uh, to different stimuli in a random fashion. That way we can't be uh, blamed or responsible for built-in bias by pre-selecting who is exposed to what treatment. The third part of experimental design is a prerequisite for it to be robust to any challenge. And this is what uh, the word replication is about. An experimental design has to be replicable. We have to be able to repeatedly try a treatment and predict the measurement that we should be observing from that treatment once we have a randomized group of experimental subjects exposed to the various controls in an experiment. Another kind of replication that's really important is the overall replicability of the entire experiment. So if, for example, in one experiment we have 40 experimental subjects, 20 who receive a placebo, 20 who receive a real treatment, all 40 who require uh, this a particular stimulus to resolve a particular illness or something like that, um, we should be able to uh, 
select another group of 40 people and observe the same degree of effectiveness of the real treatment versus the placebo in the next iteration of the experiment. So replication has uh, two meanings in the context of an experimental design. Replication of the treatment over a group of experimental subjects for, across all variations of the treatment, across all controls. That's what we would call a balanced replication of the uh, experimental trial. And the other meaning of replication is replicability of the entire experimental design. Oftentimes, in order to establish better control over uh, either lurking variables, hidden factors, or uh, variables that may impact our experimental results, uh, we use blocking, which refers to the idea that rather than running a simple randomized experimental design where we offer several treatments to the whole group of experimental subjects, we segment experimental subjects very similar to how we stratify samples of data in surveys. And we treat each block with the same spectrum of variation, with the same spectrum of controls in the experiment so as to get to the final uh, set of measurements. And then we can test the measurements across all different blocks as well as within the blocks in order to identify cause and effect between the stimulus of the experiment and the measured outcomes of the experiment. So here is a drawing, for example, of what we would call a randomized design. We first randomize part of the experimental subjects into group one and group two, then we offer one treatment to each group and we then compare the treatment results to see if the different grouping, if the different treatments uh, provide us with different, different results. So this is a traditional uh, randomized experimental design. If the experimental subjects are different, then what we might be able to do is first block the experimental subjects into different uh, blocks, then provide different selections or random assignments to different parts of the blocks, and then apply the same set of treatments to each block across the random assignment so that then we can compare the results of the experiment within blocks as well as between blocks across all treatment varietals. There is another term that you will find uh, very interesting in the development of experimental designs and it's the notion of blinding. Blinding is when one of the possible treatment details is essentially doing nothing at all to the group, to a subset, to, to the subgroup of, of experimental subjects um, through the process. And uh, while they may be, they may know or not know that uh, that they are not taking an active ingredient, so to speak, or that they're not being stimulated with a treatment that is, um, that is in effect non-neutral. So blinding refers to the characteristic of an experimental design in which the experimental subject doesn't really know that they are not being treated, that they're being given a fake treatment or a placebo in effect. Um, there's also further language in experimental design where you have what's called a single blind and double blind experiments. A single blind experiment is when uh, 
one of the groups is blinded and other groups are not. A double blind experiment is when all groups are blinded. In other words, no group is aware that they may or may not be treated. They may not be being treated by the experimental design. Say for example, you have a new drug by a pharmaceutical company. The only way to establish cause and effect between say a vaccine being effective at controlling for uh, or at providing immunity against a certain virus is, is what we call a double blind experiment. You have to be able to basically give the vaccine to all the experimental subjects and no experimental subject knows if they're getting the real vaccine or not the real vaccine. Uh, in some instances, you want single blindedness rather than double blindedness because you want to measure the placebo effect, which is an effect whereby patients taking a treatment are not getting any medication, yet they're feeling or they're reporting that they're actually, that their condition is improving. So that's called a placebo effect. Last but not least, what can go wrong in experimental design? The things that can go wrong in experimental design typically have to do with the mismanagement of the resources of running an experiment. When you're running an experiment, just like when you are piloting, just, just like when you're going to conduct a survey, piloting is essential. So always be sure in your exper experimental design to do a quote unquote dry run on your experiment. Make sure you do a mini version of your experiment with some of your resources to ensure that you're not missing anything in your experimental design. Because oftentimes, one of the biggest problems with experimental designs is the belief that you have everything under control and you really don't. And so a lot of times these uh, pre-experiments or pilot experiments uh, allow you to identify either confounding or lurking factors. Aside from that, I wish and hope that uh, you are able to enjoy the coming spring break and that uh, you're able to complete chapters eight and nine over the course of the coming two weeks so that you can move forward to the last part of the course, a course part dealing with statistical inference with the ability to, after you get a very well designed data set, being able to stretch the results from your statistical evidence and into an understanding of the general population of data so that you can make better decisions, so that you can achieve uh, reasonable and sound conclusions that are robust to other attempts at measuring the same effect by others so that you can do good science with statistics. Thank you for watching.